<laughs> hey guys, happy Thursday, happy Thursday. Good to see you all. Thanks for being here tonight. We are, uh, we're going to start a new sermon series and, you know, I got a new stand for it. So um, can helps the back a little bit, you know, something to lean on here. Um, but tonight's going to be hopefully a fun time. I'm going to start this series stronger, and we're going to talk about just for these next couple weeks some of the, the big questions that um, come up in faith and can be barriers to people's faith. So this is either going to be a really good idea or a really bad one. We'll find out soon because uh, we're going <laughs> to talk about science tonight um, and its connection to Christianity. So before we do, let's pray, and we'll uh, get into it. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that you would bless us, that you would, Lord, help us to see your wisdom and your truth and your goodness in this world. Help us, Father, to see that you are the God of creation, you're the God of science, Lord, um, and that your way is, is right and true. And so, Father, I pray that you just bless and strengthen our faith and you would meet us here in these moments together. In Christ's name, amen. Well, when I was in 10th grade, I had my 10th grade biology class, and the teacher started teaching about evolution, and we watched this movie on the Scopes trial. That was a real trial in the 20s, and it was about um, teaching evolution in the, uh, in the school, the public school systems, and it went to trial over, and it was this big thing. We watched a movie about it, and then we had to write a paper about it, and I was a brand new Christian at that point, so just, you know, maybe for like five or six months, probably less than a year, and, uh, and so I, you know, was kind of writing about this, and I said, look, I don't know how God created the world, but like however he wanted to do it, when your name's God, you can do whatever you want, however you want. You know, it's kind of, wasn't the most, you know, academically rigorous paper I've ever written, but, you know, it's 10th grade. Um, and so I wrote that, and then my teacher just, like, tore me apart on there and just was basically saying how, um, you know, anti-scientific believing in God is and just sort of, like, all this stuff. And, and I think that that attitude uh, can be pretty prevalent in our world. I don't know if you've ever experienced that where uh, there seems to be sometimes people pit science and faith against each other. That you got you to gotta either pick one side or the other, and it's a bloodbath in between. You know, or maybe people will talk about kind of uh, when they find out maybe you have belief in God, they're like, oh, that's very cute, you know, you little cute thing there. One day you're going you're gonna to learn and grow up and really use your mind, and then you won't believe in God. And, and many times kind of there is that sentiment about these things. Or, you know, it's a very kind of modern viewpoint to say, well, hasn't science ultimately displaced the need for God? Uh, hasn't it sort of, you know, brought all the answers that people used to look at in faith? And, and all of the, these tensions are around this idea of, of science and God. And I want to talk about that tonight. Now, this is a big topic, and there's a lot that I want to talk about. Uh, if you know me, that's not surprising, but, uh, but we'll see how far we can get here. And maybe um, next week I'll talk about more. But when you think about this, there's kind of different approaches as a follower of Christ that you can have. You can just kind of not worry about it, just be like, look, I'm going to just not take this problem on. I'm not going to really think about it. Um, you could abandon faith, and unfortunately, sometimes that happens, that this really becomes a barrier in people's belief in connection to God. You can become hostile towards science in general, you know, and Christianity can have a hostility towards the sciences, and I don't think that's really great. Or I think we can meet these with the, the sufficiency of Christ, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. So we're going to look at Colossians 2. And I'm going to read uh, several verses to you, but we're just going to focus on one tonight. But I want you just to see the whole paragraph of this. He says, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. 
in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I'm absent in body, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Now this next verse, this is what I want to focus on tonight and actually the next several weeks. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, if you just notice in these verses, Paul is writing to this church and he's saying, hey, I'm, I'm praying that you grow. I'm praying that your faith is growing, that it's getting stronger. And he's encouraged and he's saying, and in Christ is everything. Um, and actually Sunday, I'm going to talk about the first seven verses of this. So uh, that's what we'll be talking about then. But today we're just going to talk about verse eight here. But then he gives this, um, this what not to do. And again, that's, that's what I want our time to be focused on. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. So that's kind of the warning. That's, that's the, the thing to look out for. And as we talk about this, my prayer for us is that just through our time, that our faith would get more firmness to it. Paul says, I, I see the firmness of your faith and, and I'm encouraged. And uh, that's my hope for you and me, that as we gain confidence in our faith, in the truth and the credibility and the power of Christianity and Jesus Christ and his message and his life, then faith, I believe, begins to gain influence in our lives. As you gain confidence in your faith, then I think faith then begins to gain influence in our lives, and it's a really good thing. But here's what Paul says. He says, don't be captive. The word actually here is don't be kidnapped by philosophy. It's kind of an interesting image. When I was growing up, you know, I remember being warned about being kidnapped. Uh, never ended up being a problem for me. Maybe not, you know, the, the right target. But, <laughs> but the, the, the warnings about kidnapping were, it was always sort of underhanded. Kidnapping is, is deceptive by nature, right? It's not necessarily just a, a frontal attack because if you are walking a room and you're like, oh, that guy's a kidnapper, you're going to clear your distance. But as a kid, they would always say, yeah, if someone, if someone asks you if you want candy, you know, don't, don't take them up on it. Or if they say they got something cool in their car, be, be, there was always deception that was needed for it to happen. And Paul's kind of saying, hey, philosophy can, it can trick you. It's not going to come at you straight away, but it's going to kind of come in the side door. But it can, it can end up slowing down or getting in the way of the growth and the health of your faith. And I think this is an interesting thing to think about. And so what Paul says here, he says we have to make effort to see, because that's the main verb here, to look and to see and to watch out and to understand the philosophies that kidnap people's faith. Now, what is philosophy? Well, very simply, it's kind of the ideas that really make the world go round, but we don't always take time to think about them and understand them. Uh, philosophy, we, we live in the midst of it. The way that we see the world is, is being shaped by it, but we don't always take time to look and to say, but hey, is that the right philosophy, the right way of thinking uh, to experience the world? And it's a very powerful thing. R.C. Sproul was a great Christian thinker and theologian. Um, he was in the Pittsburgh area. So for all his great brain, he obviously miss the obvious, that God would never want him there. But anyway, you know, uh, but, he, but that's where he did a lot of little Pittsburgh jab there. Uh, but, but that's where he did uh, a lot of his ministry. And when he was a young philosophy student, he had a job just sweeping floors in a um, parking garage. And in the parking garage one day, there was an older man that was there and he was talking to him. And the older man said, hey, what do you studying in college, and he's like, philosophy. 
And as soon as he said that, the older man lit up and he started asking him all these like advanced philosophy questions. And RC's like, okay, this guy knows his stuff. Why is he sweeping with me, you know, a broke college student in this parking garage? What's going on? And he asked him to tell a story. And the man said that he actually grew up in Germany and he was a philosophy professor. And when the Nazis and Hitler took power, that as, you know, this kind of thinking guy and somewhat influential guy, he realized where this was all going and he spoke out against him. And he said that people like him then were arrested and he was arrested and all his family and most of his family was killed, but he escaped with himself and his daughter to the States. And he said, and I never want to put myself in a place that is that risky. And so he said, I'm just kind of here and I'm just trying to stay alive after what we've been through and certainly We could all probably understand that. But what R.C. Sproul said is he said, it made me realize how powerful ideas are. That this man was hunted and killed because of essentially ideas. And, And I think that's something we don't always think about. Now, what Paul says is that part of a growing faith is being aware of that. And what's interesting about it is that the philosophies that were powerful in Paul's days, Paul knew about. And we see him about, and and Paul uh, understood them through a Christian point of view, but I think we have to do that in our day as well, and to recognize them. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about, and and we're going to talk about um, really this whole idea of science and its interaction with faith. Now, I want to just basically address two big sort of misconceptions um, that get lobbied against Christianity. And the, and the first one is that Christianity has been anti-scientific or it's been really a roadblock to science. I don't know if you've heard people talk along those lines where it's kind of like, you know, the more that we get people, religious people, Christian people out of the way, the more that there can be real scientific progress in the world. And that many times when people talk about the history of science, it's this this war between religion and science. Uh, But I believe that's really a misunderstanding. And the development of modern science was not despite Christianity, but because of it. And this is something that you see argued again and again, that, that Christianity was actually the catalyst that really created modern science today. There's a great book by Nancy, Nancy Piercy called the, the Soul of Science. And it's, it's a really cool book. But in it, she says that there have been many powerful cultures in human history. But there's only been one culture that created modern science. And I think we would all say that modern science is a really good thing. Like, I love air conditioning, I love Netflix, I like my car, um, I like my microwave. All all this stuff is great, Um, and it's good, and it adds tremendous value to our life. And it's impressive to me what people can do. We just, uh, a couple weeks ago, we did a tour of a NASA site with some guys from the church, and Brad was there, and it was amazing, wasn't it? And just what, what they're able to do is remarkable. But there's been all these great civilizations, and yet only through the Western world has science become what it is. And Nancy Piercy argues that it was because of Christian beliefs that allowed science to actually gain traction and develop. And again, these are things we don't always talk about, but I think it's really helpful to know and to recognize uh, as followers of Christ. And she says that, the, that in um, Western culture, because it was influenced by Christianity, there were certain assumptions that allowed Western culture to be a soil for which science to grow. And it's things like this, that, that number one, the creation is good. Now, that is a uniquely Christian belief, 
that God created the world. We see this in Genesis 1. And then again and again, he says it was good. Now, most ancient cultures didn't look at the world and attribute goodness to it. Now, because it was good, here's what that means. It means it's worth studying, that there's value to it. Uh, Another thing that she cites is that uh, Christians believe in the dignity of work. So she says that in former times, slaves and lower class people did manual labor. That's how the, right, you, that's how the world worked in, for a lot of human history. And so manual labor was seen as generally a lower class thing. You did it not because you liked working with your hands, but because that was your sort of lot in life and you couldn't really escape that. But, she said, but what Christians did, they said all work is sanctified. All work has dignity to it, even manual labor. And and again, this helped to encourage experimentation and getting your hands dirty and things like that. And, And it created a soil for which science to grow. Also, Christians believe that the world was created by God, that there's order and purpose to it. That it's just, it's not unknowable and chaotic but that we, we can learn because God has created things with a sense of structure. And again, we take this stuff for granted, but these are uniquely Christian views. And, and because of that, it created a climate in which science could develop over time. Now, believe it or not, this was true even in the medieval era. And there's another great book. I'm going to recommend a lot of stuff to you tonight, all right? So just hold tight. But it's called The Genesis of Science by James Hanan. And this book argues that Christians in the Middle Ages, Christians, created the foundation for, again, science to develop today. Uh, And many times, again, there is this narrative out there that medieval Christians were barbarians and they were dumb and they were really change resistant. And then like Galileo and Kepler and these guys came a little later on and they sort of read it all. But, But what he says is that is a completely false narrative. And he argues that there are four really fundamental things that Christians did in the Middle Ages that created a foundation for science. Number one, you might not know this, but Christians created what we know of as the modern university today. All, the, all your student debt, you can thank medieval Christians for. <laughs> They're not going to pick up the bill, but, but that's a remarkable thing. They actually created higher education. As we know, that, that is a Christian thing as we know it today. Uh, Here's what they also did. They made incredible technological advances. Uh, And one of the most significant, two of the most significant, were number one, lenses, through which you could eventually look, you know, beyond Earth into the solar system. This was medieval Christians that did it. And number two, clocks. And clocks ended up having a really significant role because clocks became a metaphor to understanding the world. And that they would see the world as this great mechanical machine that could be broken down and understood. They also um, believed this idea that helped encourage science that if you study creation, you are learning about God. And so therefore, studying creation and learning it is learning about God. And it is a it is a really good thing to do. Again, this is a uniquely Christian perspective, and it helped quite a bit. And just on the side, too, many of the most influential figures in the history of science were driven by their faith. Their faith was not an obstacle to their science. Their faith was the reason they were in it in the first place. Let me just show you two quotes. Here's one from Kepler. He says this, I give you thanks, creator and God, that you have given me this joy in thy creation. And I rejoice in the work of your hands. See, I have now completed the work to which I was called. In it, I have used all the talents you have lent 
to my spirit. Now, Kepler was the first one to really discern how planets orbited um, around the sun. Uh, and so this, you know, was the beginning of a lot of breakthroughs in physics. But do you see his language here? He's saying this work that I'm doing, this is, a, this is my calling from God. And I'm using these talents that God has given me. He was uh, phenomenal at math, uh, which I did not get that talent. I don't know about you. Uh, but, but, that was, but, but for him, it was all an act of worship. And again, I just want to show you that so much of this progress is not despite faith, it's because of faith. That Christianity has been the greatest catalyst to what we know today as modern science. But again, there's often a very different picture that is painted in our world today. Here's another one by Isaac Newton. Uh, in his book, The, uh, the Prince, Principia, which is where he talks about gravity and his three laws. He said that he wrote this book because it will be the safest protection against the attacks of atheists. And nowhere more surely than from this quiver can one draw forth missiles against the band of godless men. So he saw his work as actually a defense of the faith. That would actually aid in people being able to show the truth and credibility of Christianity. Uh, this is Isaac Newton, kind of a big deal. Uh, so, but I just want, and there's, there's many more that, that you could pull out, but that's just to give you a little sense. So, so the first thing I just want to see, you to see is that so much of the progress of science was because it was born in the soil of Christianity. And you can find more and more, if you go down this rabbit hole, you will be amazed at how central it was. It was because of faith. It was because of a sense of God's goodness and creation, God's order, God's purpose, that so much progress was made. And so this whole concept of this war of science and faith, that is actually an enlightenment idea, but it is not really grounded in what really happened. You with me on this? So that's the first thing. Now, here's the second thing that I want to address tonight. And I want to address this idea that many times people, they, you know, I don't know if you've had people in your life talk to you and they're like, I'm a, I'm a rational person. I'm a scientific person. I'm a logical person. And so because of that, they might say, you know, that's why I don't believe in God. Or I don't, I don't believe in things that I can't see, touch, or feel. I don't know if you've thought that or you know people like that, but that's a very common way of saying it. Or just say, I, I just trust science and science alone. Here, here's a good quote that I think summarizes this position. It says, science alone is objective. So many people today, they look at science and they say, well, science, it just tells us facts. And you either take them or leave them. And if you leave them, you know, you're doing that at the expense of your intellectual integrity. Um, and, and, you know, and faith is not factor. Science alone is objective, open-minded, universal, cumulative, and progressive. Religious traditions, or let's say Christianity, by contrast, is said to be subjective, closed-minded, parochial, uncritical, and resistant to change. So that, that sort of attitude, that mindset, that perspective is what I want to talk about. Now, here's my summary of that. Just saying only science can provide us real, with real knowledge through the scientific method and no other way of knowing is reliable. So I want to talk about that, that theory. And this philosophy, it can be called many different things, um, and these are kind of different words I'll use interchangeably. It can be called scientism, where only scientific truth is true. Everything else is less true, is less reliable. Materialism, you know, only things that, that are, are matter that you can look at through a telescope or a microscope or touch with your hands um, or just natural, that just that there's, there's nothing beyond the natural world. All these are, are, are basically very, very similar. Now, I think there is a lot of problems with this philosophy. Like Paul says, 
not everything that glitters is gold. Well, he doesn't really say that, but, but he says that the, the, be careful of the empty philosophy. That, that might sound good, that might be appealing, but, but actually don't live up to what they claim. And I think this perspective that says, man, only what you can know through some scientific process is reliable and true, and therefore Christianity is unre- unreliable and not true because we can't see God in a telescope. We can't see God in a microscope. We can't quantify God in any sort of measurement that we have today. And so, well, therefore, you know, you can't really, you can't really say that that's reliable or true because it cannot be tested in any scientific methodology. I would say that that is a very prevalent philosophy today. And keep in mind, that is a philosophy. Now, people might say, well, no, that's fact. Well, it's interesting you bring that up, you know, Uh, because we have to ask the question, you know, what does make something true? Uh, And if you, you know, you try to think about that for a minute in your mind, you might say, well, something's true because, you know, it's real or it's it's factual. And then you say, well, what makes something real or it's factual? You say, well, because it's true. You say, all right, well, what makes it true? And then you kind of go, you, it kind of creates a circle. And these are, now these are very, very basic questions. And this is what you do in philosophy, by the way. And you're like, is there any purpose or reason to it? Yes, there is. It actually can be helpful. It can also be annoying and put you to, to sleep. But today, hopefully, it will be somewhat helpful. But just think about this with me for a second. So what is true? What, what is fact? Now, people would say, well, we, we need a, a theory on this. And one of the most prevalent theories of truth is what's called a correspondence theory of truth. And that means something is true if it corresponds to reality, which makes sense, right? This is kind of uh, solid, and that seems to correspond to reality. If I said, yeah, this is really squishy and soft, and then you touch it, you'd be like, I don't think it is. It doesn't, it doesn't correspond to reality. And that, that seems to make sense. But that actually isn't as clear cut <laughs> as it sounds. This is philosophy here. But let me but just go with me on this. Immanuel Kant, he says, well, how do we know that what we're seeing and experience in life is really what something is? How do we know that, that there isn't, for lack of a better term, rose-colored glasses that we're wearing all the time? Have you ever wore a pair of glasses that color everything that you see? Well, he says, well, what if that's actually what our mind is? And so he went so far as to say that we can't actually ever really know what something is. We can only know what it appears to be. And when you try to actually argue that, it, it's kind of hard to really come to a final conclusion on it apart from the reality of God. Now, Here's where it gets even, let's go a little bit deeper. Are you with me on this? Um, if, we were to, if we were to just put like a pen in front of us or on this table and, and just imagine there, there's a pen on your lap right now. And you say, well, I know this pen is there because I can grab it with my hand. Now imagine if, you know, there is a drawer underneath you and you put the pen in the drawer. And someone says, well, is that pen still there? And you would say, yes, it's still there. And you would say, well, how do you, how do you know? Um, and you might say, well, I put it in the drawer and I, I close the drawer and all that would be true. And generally, when I close the door, it does not disappear. <laughs> but here's just what I want you to know. You actually know those things two different ways. If the pen is on my lap, I know it one way. I understand it because I I can see it, touch it. If it's in the drawer, I know it a different way that is more conceptual. You with me on this? That in other words, you know it because you know that the world that we live in, generally things do not disappear when you put them away, unless it's a fridge, unless it's your keys. (laughs) Then the, just kidding. Um, Yeah, your socks, (laughs) yeah. Um, but, but what I just want to show you is that you, there is a mix of facts and concepts at all times. 
in everything that we think about and everything that we know and everything that we... There isn't just some plain, clear, okay, this is the data, and it's just, it's just completely without concept and philosophy behind it. And again, that's why these statements are problematic. You with me on this? Now, this is something that many scientists will say. And in fact, everything that I'm going to tell you comes from the scientific community, not the Christian community. This is them critiquing the, the, uh, the, the limits of kind of this sort of hard science. Now, there was uh, two physicists named uh, Duhem and Quine, and they said this. They said that when you make a scientific hypothesis, and go with me back to eighth grade when you learned about the scientific method, you know, and you have a hypothesis and you test it and you have an experiment and you observe and you try to make it repeatable. He said, well, when you are doing all of that and you're testing a hypothesis, he says ultimately that one hypothesis is never one hypothesis. That within every experiment, because of the facts and the concepts and all this mixing together, and that we bring into our thinking in our life, he says that you're testing multiple hypotheses always at all times. And so the results that you get, you don't really know with as much clarity as we would like to make it seem what actually worked and what didn't work. You with me on this? And this is called the quine duhem theory. Um, and this is a philosophy of science issue. Now, because of that, there is this idea called underdetermination. And what that means, yeah, you, we're, I told you, it's either going to be really bad or really good. <laughs> but underdetermination just basically says that you can get data where two rival hypotheses explain the data, but they're two very different things. All of this is to say is that what we can see, touch, look at, observe, isn't always as clear-cut as the world makes it out to be. And faith isn't as crazy as people want to say. And belief in God is not as irrational as many times people make it seem to be. Now, there's a lot more I could go on about, but I'll just give you a couple more. There's another great book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. This will, and uh, it's a very famous book. It's written by Thomas Kuhn, and he was a physicist and a historian of science. And uh, as a physicist, he was trying to understand ancient physics, and he was trying to understand Aristotle, the Greek philosopher who wrote, um, you know, uh, some theories on physics. And then he was comparing Aristotle with Newton, Isaac Newton's physics. And he realized that Newton didn't like change Aristotle or build on Aristotle, but it was like Aristotle never existed and he just started over and, you know, created this new system. And so it, it started to puzzle him. And then he began to just research this and understand. And here's what he ultimately said. He said that we think about the progress of science, like we have a brick of knowledge in one era of time and another brick and another brick, and they add up and they build this big structure of knowledge. That's what we think, that there's this, this constant progression that we're learning more and more, and it's just building more and more into human knowledge. But here's what Thomas Kuhn said. He said, that's actually not what happens. He said, he said you can't compare theories that they're, they're asking really different questions, that they're highly sociological, that they're dealing with the questions and the viewpoints of their day. And again, he's not saying that there isn't real progress in science, but he's saying it's not what we think. It tends to be this complete triumph of clear and perfect knowledge, but it's way, way messier than that. And I think that's pretty interesting. And he says that these ideas are driven as much by the metaphors and the perspectives of the world as they are by the data and the things that are found. And again, this is a guy writing within this community. This book is very 
um, has been out since the 60s um, and very well read. In fact, the whole word uh, or phrase paradigm shift comes from this book. That's where it originated. Um, so anyway, so there's a lot there. Now, here's just my whole point in saying all this. <laughs> Is there a point? Um, here, here's my whole point. It's just looking at the world and saying the scientific perspective is the only legitimate one, even people in that community would say you can't do that. <laughs> that there's, there's too many holes. There's too many gaps. There's too, too many problems. Um, and it doesn't always deliver what it promises. Now, again, I'm not saying we should be anti-science or anything like that. It, it's all great. But I think we have to recognize the limits of it. And we have to realize as well that many of the most important questions in our life, it can't clearly or in a satisfactory way answer. And going back to Colossians, here's what Paul says. He says, in Christ is the knowledge and wisdom of God. Now here's what I believe. Men and women who were in Christ gave birth to some of the great blessings of science that we have. That that, that, was not, that was not a detriment to it. It was what made it possible. And today, I think that same thing should happen, that, that it should live within the soil of Christianity. And that science is a great tool, and it's a great blessing, but it has limitations, and it can't answer all our questions, and it is not the only way to know what is real and what is true in this world. That there are natural ways, but there are also supernatural ways. And believing in supernatural realities and believing in miracles and believing in God does not make you anti-scientific at all. Nor does it make you irrational, nor does it make you have to sacrifice your intellect or anything like that. But actually, I think it helps quite a bit. So, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> In Christ is the wisdom and knowledge of God. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us. I pray, Father, that where barriers get in the way of our faith, that, Father, you could help us to see them. I pray, Lord, for maybe people in our life that stumble through some of these things, and, and it's, uh, it's something that, that might be keeping them from you, Lord. I pray that you would give us the wisdom, give us the words, give us that, the opportunity to help them to overcome. Father, I pray that we could see that you are wise, that, that everything begins and ends with you. And that, Lord, starting with you is the right place. That there is tremendous blessing in science, Lord, and we don't need to be afraid of it, and we don't need to run from it. We don't need to be hostile at any means, but, Lord, help us also to see the great value of faith. Help us to see that in you is the wisdom and knowledge that we need not just for this life, but the life to come. And help us to see the harmony amidst it all. So bless us in this, guide us in this. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen.